So, Professor Stiglitz, uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to this institute. So, I'm Yoichi Mine, Executive Director of JICA Research Institute, um, honoring the name of the uh, late uh, Madame Sadako Ogata. Okay, thank you very much. So, just okay. for ice breaking, if you don't mind, um, let me talk about um, my university. I'm working full time for JICA, but at the same time, I'm uh, giving lecture at Doshisha University in Kyoto. And actually, the founder of Doshisha University, um, he graduated, um, his name is Anijima, graduated from the Amherst College in 1870, more than 150 years ago. So I think you didn't, you were not born at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, since then, the uh, Doshisha University and Amherst College um, have um, you know, developed special relationships. So I know something about the liberal art, you know, uh, the tradition of liberal arts. So the uh, people just, you know, can learn anything, combining all the disciplines um, spanning from natural science uh, to social sciences and humanities. So the, I, I think this is a quite uh, relevant uh, in our time because we face uh, quite a lot of poly, poly crisis and multiple complex and compounding crises. So we should combine um, is all different academic disciplines to cope with such multiple you know, crises. So how do you think about um, this kind of the uh, positive aspect of the legacy of liberal arts? Do you think it is still relevant to our oh, time? Very much so. Well, yeah. Let me just comment that mm. Uh, Amherst, as you said, is a small liberal arts, yeah, arts yeah. college. When I went there, mm -hmm. there were only a thousand men, uh, yeah. not with uh, co-ed, and, and it's a little larger, 1600. Uh, it believed in small classes with a lot of dialogue and, mm -hmm. and, and discussion. Mm -hmm. um, the picture of uh, the founder of Doshisha sat at the center of our chapel, and we had to go to chapel uh, twice a week. Okay. So I knew his face very, very, uh, very clearly. And I knew the history of our relationship with Doshisha. And then I was very pleased when Doshisha offered me an honorary doctorate uh, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. A liberal arts education has really had a very big influence uh, on me. Um, when I was at Amherst, I studied history, English, physics, uh, economics, mathematics. Um, and so when I started my PhD in economics, uh, I had already gotten a very strong basic in mathematics, but I also understood both history and physics. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, uh, I think was different from many of m my other classmates. Uh, it enabled me to see what was going on in economics and historical perspective. Uh, the issue I was interested in is poverty, inequality, development. And I could see development from a more of a historical process than just a, a mathematical uh, issue. Um, so, uh, I think we've lost something in the way which higher education has become more and more narrow, more and more, you might say, professional, job-related, rather than mm -hmm. trying to understand broader societal forces. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you for the reassuring message. Yes. I think this is quite uh, important for students and also the uh, development practitioners in such organizations like as JICA, uh, because we have to get out of silos uh, because of the complex nature of the crisis surrounding us. So in this connection, uh, let me talk briefly about the uh, theory of human security propounded by the president of JICA, uh, Professor Akihiko Tanaka. So he was talking about the three layered systems. Um, the first is a physical system, the earth. 
you know. So we face the um, natural disasters and climate change. It's basically from this physical, physical system, the Earth. And the second layer is living system. So this is, uh, you know, the basis for agriculture and also the bacteria and virus. And so pandemics like COVID-19 is coming from this living system. And the third layer is a social system. So the, we have the violent conflict and poverty. Uh, this is basically related to our social system. And these you know, three systems are interconnected and intertwined very much. So the Ukraine war, for example, war is war, um, but this gives rise to um, food insecurity, and also the energy insecurity and the financial insecurities. So all these, you know, systems are intertwined. So the um, I think we should better combine is, uh, no, the different disciplines uh, to address this very much complex, you know, um, global crisis. Okay. So the combining natural science, engineering is necessary uh, to prevent the calamities related to you know, um, climate change. And also medical scientists, uh, we should collaborate with them to cope with COVID-19. So the, I think you are originally from the physics side, right. and you converted to social sciences, if I remember correctly. Okay. So why did you change your subject from the natural science to you know, more human? human-oriented sciences. <laughs> well, the reason I changed was that, that I, I found uh, physics uh, extraordinarily interesting, the mm -hmm. fact that you could explain in simple equations mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. uh, was absolutely fascinating. But uh, the problems that really motivated me, the things I cared about, uh, uh, were social problems. Mm -hmm. uh, the inequality I had seen as I had grown up, uh, the economic fluctuations that caused such trauma, uh, the racial segregation and discrimination mm -hmm. that I saw uh, so rampant uh, in our society. Uh, these were the things that really kept bothering me. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, I wanted to use some of what I'd learned in mathemat mathematics and my physics, mm -hmm. but the thing I wanted to really understand were, were the uh, so solutions to these social problems, what were the impediments to uh, creating a better world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Regrettably, uh, in the 50 years, and 55, 60 years since I began studying, mm -hmm. some of the problems, like inequality, have grown worse. Mm -hmm. uh, we understand them better, but we haven't been able to uh, do as much about them as we should be able to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We should um, connect the scientific thinking, you know. Uh, to uh, with the uh, you know some you know some policy making and also the social problems and then so okay um, you uh, you are part of the uh, um, so called Stiglitz um, Sen Fitusi Commission and the report was published in two thousand nine so but this was uh, to uh, was suggest some ways to go beyond GDP so the I I still remember. Um, I read the text of the commission report uh, soon after the publication. I'm so fascinated. So, um, could you um, explain a little bit about the um, the you know the real core message of the report? And um, this was uh, basically co-chaired by three eminent scholars. So, what is your take about this? You know, <laughs> the message. So, your own emphasis on the uh, yeah. So. Uh, the main message mm -hmm. was a very simple one mm -hmm. that uh, GDP didn't measure uh, many key aspects of what was important mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, unfortunately economics had focused on GDP. Uh, we had to go beyond GDP as a social scientists. Uh, we needed to develop broader measures of uh, uh, these other things that we had left out. Um, 
a central message uh, uh, that I've uh, uh, emphasized over and over again is uh, that what we measure affects what we do, and what we doesn't we don't measure uh, channels what we don't do. Uh, if we don't measure poverty, we won't do very much about poverty. If we don't measure inequality, we won't do. We it won't get the attention that it deserves. And this is especially uh, important in our very uh, uh, performance-oriented society. We want to know how well we're doing. So measures really, metrics really matter mm -hmm. a, a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, we we looked at a gamut of issues. Um, some of them we made progress on in the time of the commission, and some of them we said these are important issues, but we haven't had time to finalize. Uh, but we hope that in the future there will be more work. Uh, the areas that we talked about uh, a, a lot. Uh, there were at least uh, two. One was inequality, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that uh, GDP could be going up, and yet most people in society could be worse off. All the money could be going to a few people at the top. And I felt that very intensely because that was what was happening in the United States. Even though GDP was going up, mm -hmm. the people in the middle were seeing their income stagnate. So while many people were looking to the U.S. as a very successful economy, I was saying it wasn't so successful mm -hmm. because it's very nice that Bill Gates and uh, Elon Musk are, are making more and more money, but what's happening mm -hmm. to the typical American? And they weren't doing very well. Life expectancy is going down and... Uh, um, uh, that's a, another dimension of inequality that was really important. Uh, so uh, that was one issue. Another one, obviously very important, is sustainability. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons I undertook, uh, agreed to, to, to share, co-chair this commission, was when I had been... Uh, a member, then chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors of President Clinton, mm -hmm. I had tried. Mm -hmm. I had tried to go beyond GDP. We tried to develop a, a green GDP measure uh, that reflected environmental degradation and resource depletion. And uh, some members of Congress threatened to cut off all our financing if we continue to do work, work on that. And that was from the coal industry. They didn't want people to talk about environmental degradation or resource depletion. And I knew we were doing something important mm -hmm. because it was a threat to these industries that were killing our society. Mm -hmm. um, and then President Sarkozy came along and he, he, he had a, a very wise view on this. Uh, his view is... Uh, he was going to be graded on how well the economy was doing mm -hmm. by measures like GDP, but he knew that his citizens cared about the quality of life. And that disparity between how he was being graded in GDP mm -hmm. and what the, the citizens cared about caused the tension. And he wanted to say, can we do a better job mm -hmm. in integrating what we care about into, into our metrics. An another measure, another area where we did not make as much progress as I had hoped, but we made a little bit more progress in a subsequent uh, study that we did for the OECD mm -hmm. was on insecurity. I know a subject of uh, Madame Ogata's uh, great concern. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, it, it obviously has a very big effect on people's lives. And uh, that's an area where I think we have made, su since then, some progress in uh, measuring insecurity. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, uh, 
A lot of the uh, frontier areas was it, as proposed by the commission report. So at uh, one point uh, you talked about the in, um, inequalities. The average household is not necessarily typical household. And there are a lot of uh, different measures to gauge inequalities. And most maybe popular is maybe uh, Gini coefficient and also Palma ratio. And also, you know, there's a lot of different <laughs> <laughs> measurements. Um, but um, the scholar like uh, Branko Milanovic uh, proposed very interesting perspectives uh, like, you know, inequality can be multidimensional. It's like, you know, within country inequality and international inequalities and also global citizens inequalities. So the, if we change method, you know, we, we may have different kind of image of the world. So it's quite interesting. And these three approaches correspond to the uh, kind of the, you know, Immanuel Kant, the perpetual peace, you know, three, you know, nation state and international federation and global society. So I, I, I think it's a quite uh, interesting progress has been made um, about the uh, measurement of inequality since then. It's quite fascinating. And then you also mentioned the, uh, you know, the sustainability. And I think the organization like JICA should cooperate more with the business firms and engineers uh, to make society innovative. Okay. So it's a lo okay, lot of other topics, but uh, here, uh, let me ask you one question about uh, dashboard thinking and single number thinking. <laughs> so um, it's, you know, the, I remember it was in 1999, um, in the Human Development Report, uh, Professor Amartya Sen wrote an uh, assessment of Human Development Index, you know, and this was just one page, uh, it's, uh, you know, essay, but he described Human Development Index, uh, which is an average, simple average of the, uh, you know, health, education, and income. It's very much crude index, you know. <laughs> We can't uh, use human development index just to describe this complex nature of the human life. So GDP is bad, just a sim single number, but the human development index is also single number, you know. This is too crude. So, and he repeated the term crude seven times in just one page essay. You know? oh. So it's very interesting. But at the same time, uh, the Amartya Sen uh, described Human Development Index was very powerful the, because this is a single number <laughs> as an alternative to GDP. So the single number index can be politically very powerful. And uh, this is more sensitive to, uh, you know, wider aspects of human life than GDP. So this is also quite a convincing argument. So I'm still, um, you know, um, not decided about the, you know, which is better, <laughs> single number or multiple dashboard. So uh, could you tell me your take about this, you know? Yeah, the <laughs> we debated that question a lot on the commission. Mm -hmm. And uh, we came very strongly to the conclusion that uh, you cannot summarize anything as mm. complex uh, as our society in a single number. You can't summarize it in five numbers, but a dashboard of five, ten numbers uh, gives you a more comprehensive uh, picture. The way I illustrate that is uh, two numbers that are important when you're driving are how fast you're going and how many go miles you can go before your gas tank goes empty. Mm -hmm. If you added those two numbers together, mm -hmm. you would have no information at all. Okay. You wouldn't know anything of either about how whether you're safe or whether you can get to where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Single numbers lose information that may be very important. And that's why a dashboard, mm -hmm. you want the smallest number mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that is still politically powerful. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's very important, same way in the United States, that GDP may be one number you want to mm -hmm. look at, but the fact that health life expectancy is going down mm -hmm. is telling you something that 
is very GDP going up is good. Health life expectancy going down is very bad. It says something is wrong, is not functioning well in that society. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing about sustainability. Uh, that's how far you could drive. You want to know, are we living within our planetary boundaries? Mm -hmm. That's that first level you talked about mm -hmm. at, at the beginning of our discussion. Uh, and so that's imperative to know. Mm -hmm. So to me, uh, you need a dashboard. Mm -hmm. Now, at various times, you can engage in a debate about, you know, a single number to try to focus attention. Uh, what is interesting about the single number approach is how fragile it can be. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in the HDI, uh, the Human Development Indicator, uh, the United States was not at the top, mm -hmm. it was around six. But then they came up with a new index, which was the inequality adjusted HDI, mm -hmm. which they try to take yeah, into yeah, account yeah. the inequalities in society. And the United States dropped from a, like sixth to 23rd. And that shows you the fragility. The uh, United States might have boasted how well we were doing, not as good as Scandinavia, but we were doing very well. But once you took into account inequality, you were doing very poorly. I think we we constantly need as a society to have all these numbers in front of us and then to debate which is relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, maybe if you're Elon Musk, you mm -hmm. might like GDP as a good number. But if you're the average American, mm -hmm. uh, you might want to say, no, that's not telling us uh, what is important. Uh, what's more important is median income, income in the middle, or life expectancy, or, or other indicators of well-being. Okay. So the Americans and Japanese may want to have different indicators, but uh, you know these still should be uh, compatible. So I think we should engage in just a dialogue and discussions globally about the uh, most appropriate indicators. Yeah. yeah. Part of the reason for this is that we want to know uh, what policies will be best in increasing standards of living of our people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think every country cares about health and longevity, mm -hmm. you know, th that is one of the, the things uh, that is very important. Mm -hmm. The fact that Japan has the longest life expectancy mm -hmm. means that we want to study what is something about Japanese society mm -hmm. is good for longevity. Mm -hmm. So that's an important thing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, U.S. may have are stronger in areas of innovation. Yes, yes. And Japan may want to study, okay, here is a measure of innovation. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Japan's not doing as well in that way recently. Maybe it's new firms, maybe it's the universities. It focuses your attention then to say, what is it about the structure of American society facilitates certain kinds of innovation? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe American society and Japanese society are maybe complementary in some ways, <laughs> <laughs> contrasting and complementary. Okay. Uh, the final word about dashboard, um, you know, what we measure affects uh, what we do. So that's very true. But I think um, there is some, you know, the other way around. Um, what we do affects what we measure. <laughs> because, you know, we uh, just watch carefully the dashboard when we drive, you know, to go somewhere, you know, purposefully. So the I think this you know is maybe is, you know I'm now representing um, JICA uh, is a cooperation development cooperation agency. So I sometimes think we need our own dashboard uh, to check our own practice and yeah. quality. You know, so maybe I think we may want to develop some kind of human security indicators or something. You know, for our own the the, the betterment of our own practice. So 
a, uh, I know you are very busy, but we appreciate it if you could collaborate with this kind of, mm. you know, a specific mm. index making for the development practitioners. Yeah. yeah. No, I think human security is is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many dimensions to human mm -hmm. security, uh, some of which are are uh, more easily measurable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are certain kinds of deprivations mm -hmm. that are of great concern, like uh, food insecurity. Mm -hmm. What fraction of the population, for instance, goes to sleep once a month? without uh, hungry, not because they're on a diet, but because there's not enough food. Mm -hmm. uh, th those are measures of food insecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, there are measures of income vulnerability. Mm -hmm. What is the probability that if you're above the poverty line, mm -hmm. you're going to sleep sink below, significantly below the poverty line within one year or within a span of five years. Mm -hmm. uh, an awful lot of Americans mm -hmm. are not in poverty, mm -hmm. but will go through episodes of mm -hmm. poverty okay. in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that colors their life. You know, it's that fear of not having enough food, not being able to have cl money to p buy clothes for your children, mm -hmm. that that colors their life, even when they're not in poverty. So that kind of vulnerability mm -hmm. is an important uh, dimension as well. Health insecurity is a very big aspect in America because we don't have a good uh, healthcare system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're at the top, we have some of the best health care anywhere in the world. But if you are uh, uh, lower down, um, there's no public health uh, provision like there is in most countries in the advanced world. And that means uh, if you get sick, uh, there's a real worry. I mean, at mm -hmm. the end, the hospitals will take you, but mm -hmm. it may be too late by then. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Health insecurity is another aspect of human insecurity. Okay, um, the human security was, has been debated uh, quite uh, because of this term security. You know, the political scientists and the scholars of international relations um, discussed much about human security uh, in terms of the agenda to protect civilians in emergency situations. But uh, okay, this is okay. Um, but uh, I think this is also a kind of distortion because human security was born in 1994. It was coined by uh, late Mabubul Haq. Uh, he was a development economist yes, and based on the human development agenda. So human security and human development are kind of siblings, you know. So the I think the economic security is part of human security. And actually, this notion was picked up by late, um, you know, Mr. Obuchi, uh, the Japanese foreign minister and prime minister, and uh, was just after the uh, Asian financial crisis in 1997. So the Japanese government started to promote mainstream yeah. this idea of human security, uh, just combining freedom from fear and freedom from want and freedom yeah. to live in dignity, uh, freedom yeah. from the indignity. You know? So the, uh, it's a quite a comprehensive um, idea. So the uh, Amatya Sen uh, described a human security concept in so-called Ogata Sen report as the we need uh, growth with equity and downturns with security. I think this aptly, you know, captures the essence of human security approach. Mm -hmm. So we really want to combine this peace agenda and also the economic security agenda. So. Uh, is this okay for you? The I don't know. Yeah. In the USA, the you know security discourse might be, but the social security, you know, economic security is also security. You know. Oh, very much so, and yeah. that's why I mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, when, when uh, but there are many other dimensions. I mean, mm -hmm. economic security, of course, as an economist, what mm -hmm. we think about first. Uh, we did a very big uh, study when I was chief economist of the World mm -hmm. Bank. Mm -hmm. 
which was called Voices of the Poor. Oh, yes. And we wanted to ascertain what were the things that were most important to people uh, at the bottom. And obviously, economic security, income, was the most important. Mm -hmm. But they also raised the question of uh, a broader sense of insecurity, mm -hmm. uh, including one of the things I do, we haven't talked about is physical insecurity. Uh, you can't really be freedom uh, have freedom from fear if you are physically uh, insecure. Mm -hmm. Um, and they also talked about the importance of voice, which is really very much related to what you were talking about, dignity. If, mm -hmm. if people feel that they don't have a voice in the fact, things that affect their lives, uh, it, it's taking away their dignity. Mm -hmm. In the, let me comment on one thing about, about uh, growth uh, with equity. I think there's also growth with security, and, mm -hmm. and that, that's really something that that hasn't been uh, uh, taken sufficiently into account uh, in more developed countries, particularly, that uh, all growth is associated mm -hmm. with structural transformation. Okay. Structural transformation means that some industries, some sectors, uh, get smaller and some get bigger. Mm -hmm. You go from agriculture to manufacturing to a service sector to a knowledge-based economy. And each of these transformations entails some displacement of jobs. And uh, the question is, what happens to the people who lose their jobs? Do they have a future with dignity? Uh, 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 can society accommodate them, or do they throw them in the rubbish heap, uh, like disposable, uh, you know, something disposable? And it seems to me that's where our societies, particularly U.S., uh, has failed very badly. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the reasons, I think, for our political dysfunction. Mm -hmm that there are large fractions of the people in the deindustrialized parts of the country who, as the country deindustrialized, were pushed aside, were felt like uh, were, weren't given an alternative, mm -hmm. have uh, felt excluded from society, mm -hmm. uh, but are also facing a high level of insecurity. Mm -hmm. So part of growth with equity has to have growth with security as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the human security is important. So the human insecurity is also important uh, because the health is important. So we have to attack the you know sickness and you know disease so, uh, to promote our health. So the human insecurity is also quite you know objective and subjective. So I think we should address the uh, subjectivity, um, not only happiness but also people's fear and anxiety and sometimes anger you know so the um once um we at the jaica institute we organized joint research uh, with uh, professor francis stewart at the oxford university about horizontal I, inequality i know her very well yeah. <laughs> it was a fascinating collaboration and um so she and her team uh, proposed the concept of horizontal inequality is an inequality between groups uh, not in the Visuals, but uh, between groups. So that's why it's horizontal inequalities. And also the multiple dimensions and economic inequality is, of course, important, but we do have sophisticated uh, measure to, for measurement of economic security. But we also try to think of the political insecurity um, is a, you know, a political uh, inequality about the representation, political representation, and also cultural status, you know, uh, inequality. So this relates to uh, dignity aspect of human security. So the uh, people take action not because of statistics, but uh, perceptions, you know, subjective perceptions about their status. 
So the recently, I think the many development economists are started to pay attention to this kind of attitude and also dignity. Um, like uh, he's not economist, but a po political philosopher Michael Sandel is talking about the uh, dignity of work, and also the uh, Banaji and Dufro. Um, they argued about the you know what matter is the. Uh, you know, attitude of the uh, government and, you know, aid givers, you know, if you treat so-called beneficiaries of aid as some, you know, you look down on them and you don't pay respect for them. So, you know, the key word can be trust, you know, is lost and people feel, you know, deprived, not only materi materially, but also psychologically, you know. It's also quite uh, important uh, uh, to see as a lot of the practice-oriented economists started to talk about this human dignity aspect. <laughs> so, but uh, still, I think it is quite important to measure uh, this kind of group-based deprivation. So, I think the national statistical officers uh, should try to collect data uh, based on, you know, some groups, identities, and also based on the, you know, some sub-national divisions like municipalities or counties, you know. So I think we have to do quite a lot uh, in this area, you know, collecting okay. data at the sub-national level and also the group level. Yeah, I agree. And uh, let me first bring this back to yeah. the development debate. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, again, when I was chief economist at the World Bank that we were very sensitive about was the conditionality, mm -hmm. the way the World Bank gave foreign aid uh, and the IMF, uh, particularly at that time, was that it would impose a set of conditions on the countries that really made them feel like they were being uh, subjugated. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a neo-colonialism. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's continued. Uh, we've tried to use words like partnership, and um, but <clears throat> that overall tone uh, has been softened, and I think they're trying to soften it more, but it's very important for this mm -hmm issue of dignity and self-determination uh, that that one uh, uh, move out of the vocabulary of conditionality to uh, um, uh, a more constructive uh, engagement uh, with the country. Uh, and that's particularly because uh, true. Many of the, some of the conditions are related to whether the aid will be usefully uh, used. Mm -hmm. But many of the conditions were simply uh, neocolonial conditions imposed on the country, uh, country uh, conditions imposed because the, it was an in interest of special interest in the United States or Europe mm -hmm. uh, to uh, have those conditions imposed or was part of the neoliberal ideology. Mm -hmm. So, I think uh, for a long while, uh, A failed in part because of what it did to the policy space, to the dignity uh, of the countries that were the recipients. Mm -hmm. um, on a second point, um, we, in our, in our original study and in our subsequent work at the OECD, we did look a lot at subjective perceptions. Uh, we we uh, uh, inquired into the reliability of those studies that were done on subjective perceptions. Uh, they were uh, very reliable. Alan, Alan Kruger, the late Alan Kruger, led our work in that particular uh, area, uh, did a, a very impressive work. Um, the one of the interesting things that we did study mm -hmm. was the correlation mm -hmm. between subjective perceptions and objective reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they were highly correlated, but not perfectly correlated. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was uh, something to look at the issue of perceptions as well as uh, the actual experiences. Uh, 
Um, and, uh, you know, some societies uh, have a greater confidence. Uh, they, they may have a perception everything is going well. When you look at the data, their life expectancy is going down. And mm -hmm. Things are not going so well and vice versa in, in, other, uh, in, in other societies. Um, the third thing, uh, the distinctions, the horizontal inequities that you mentioned, uh, are are really very important, mm -hmm. and um, there are a variety of bases for these. You might say group identification. Um, geography is one; mm -hmm. it is important, and one of the things where the place-based neoliberal model, uh, where the the neoliberal model went wrong, was it ignored place. Mm -hmm. Uh, it said there's free mobility, people don't have any sense of identity. Um, you know, so what if everybody leaves Greece? <laughs> that's, you know, if economic efficiency says they were supposed to leave Greece, that's, that's uh, let's accept that. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Greeks were not so happy about uh, that idea in the Euro crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that notion of of how different groups in society, in Europe, different nationalities. Uh, I think that's a really important uh, aspect of, of, you might say, well-being and a sense of inequality. Um, different places do make uh, a difference. Uh, mm -hmm. In the United States, a little bit different from Japan, uh, we have different racial and ethnic groups. And one of the very big divisions is between the treatment of African Americans and mm -hmm. and uh, and others, and that's something that the country is having a very hard time coming to terms with. I mean, part of the country uh, mm -hmm. is very uh, concerned about a reconciliation or trying to do something to overcome these very large gaps through affirmative action, through other actions. But another part of the country wants to bury the past mm -hmm. and pretend uh, that you can ignore these divisions mm -hmm. and that they aren't important. So we have now a division in the country about how we deal with our divisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the world is divided, but at the same time quite diverse. So when we think of the neoliberalism, I think we should start, uh, we should begin to see the world from the you know, perspective of the periphery. So, and actually, um, I'm also supposed to be a specialist of African area studies. <laughs> Africa is a continent so yeah. big, so I um, only visit uh, Southern Africa is, uh, quite regularly. But I think the Professor Stiglitz, you also visited um, African countries uh, like Kenya is quite often. Well, I spent yeah. a lot of time with my youth yeah. in Kenya, 1969 yeah, yeah, to 71, yeah. but also visited South Africa, yeah. West Africa, yeah. North Africa. So the Africans are not necessarily pessimistic about the future. But the people in the West West uh, tend to be so you know <laughs> pessimistic about the future. But African young people can be quite op optimistic about you know their own you know um, destination of the progress. Or anyway, so the um, but in most uh, indicators, global indicators, the Africa tend to be painted you know very dark. <laughs> If we use the uh, well-being indicators or sustainability indicators, so Africa tended to be, you know, the lowest on the ladders of development of the uh, world nations. But at the same time, uh, is my gut feeling is, um, you know, if we measure the peoples, you know, the, the nations in terms of kind of survivability or also the riches of natural resources. Maybe we may have some quite a completely different kind of the picture of the world. So, but how do you think about this? You know, but you know, most statistics and most indicators, the Africa ranked the lowest. Yeah, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually very worried. Yeah, uh, I'm on the on the more pessimistic mm -hmm. uh, side. You know, I I first went to, to Africa in, mm -hmm. uh, in 1969. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, the progress that has been made in uh, the 55 years since then mm -hmm. has been enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, and th from that point of view, there's a basis of some optimism. Uh, uh, they were left uh, by their colonial masters with mm -hmm. uh, a heritage without infrastructure, without education, uh, uh, without uh, institutions. It, it was really very sad and mm -hmm. al almost criminal. And, mm -hmm. and what they've done since then on their own has been quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, what has happened is the population has grown. Uh, they went from a country where there was land rich, mm -hmm to one where there's a land, uh, a continent where there's a land scarcity, uh, where they're hitting the uh, planetary boundaries, uh, the resource boundaries of, of uh, um, and uh, where looking into the future, mm -hmm. The projections of the population growth by 2100 mm -hmm. make the challenges of employment mm -hmm. and income and security uh, very daunting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, you know, I, I view the the progress as as really impressive, but uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, being able to mm -hmm. address the demographic challenge yeah. of uh, of the remaining parts of this century mm -hmm. uh, are, I think, very, very daunting. The job creation is quite critically important for Africans, and this is a topic of our discussion later today. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of challenges, and actually last week I was in South Africa, and having so-called load shedding, the sudden electricity cut. So uh -huh. it's nice to watch the stars, you know. <laughs> but at the same time, it's a quite a huge problem in the economic development and the maintenance of infrastructure. There's a lot of things that should be done. Okay. Okay. So the um, finally, um, I want to ask you the question about the a. a uh, you know him very well, Professor Uzawa Hiromi. <laughs> I moved to Doshisha University uh, 2010, and he retired uh, 2009. So this was uh, actually our path didn't cross, but uh, actually I read quite a lot uh, written by him. So actually, this is why I decided uh, to. Uh, study economics because of him, <laughs> his writings on the social cost of the, the motor vehicle yes. and the paperback was a very much uh, is a compact but very good, nice book. And so the um, he was the uh, director of the research center of um, uh, social common capital and Doshisha University. So he spent uh, his late life uh, in Kyoto. Uh, concentrating on the research on the commons and also social overhead capital, social common capital. And for him, the social common capital is, you know, include natural capital and also the physical capital uh, like infrastructure, and industrial and social infrastructure, and also institutions. Okay. So, and I think and he basically, uh, he argued such, you know, commons or social common capital should be maintained by the government and the national economies. So it was very clear. But in his late writings, he also emphasized, you know, these commons should be maintained uh, both, uh, you know, by the government and, you know, by the uh, locality, you know, self-government. So always, you know, nation and or locality. So he started to repeat this, you know. And in the countryside, actually he was born uh, in the uh, um, Tottori prefecture, is, a, uh, is you know, is a quite a far away from Tokyo. And uh, in his late, later, in his writings, and he also uh, quite... Uh, uh, you know, pay attention to the revival of countryside 
uh, rural countryside and agriculture. So he even, you know, uh, suggested we may try to maintain the ratio of rural population in Japan, maybe around 20% or so. <laughs> so but, uh, you know, this may require national debate and consensus and subsidy. But, uh, you know, in addition to this, uh, Professor Uzawa uh, pinpointed the problem. Okay, so this is not just a question of subsidy, but also, you know, this is a question of people making villages attractive you know, and try to maintain the village influx, infrastructure by themselves. You know. So the um, uh, here comes the uh, interesting uh, question of translation. So I think Professor Ozawa was uh, speaking English with you, you know, and he wrote extensively, you know, in English. But uh, he was writing a major part of these, his thesis and books in Japanese. Yeah. So the, uh, the question of translation. So he translated uh, the English term commons into uh, the Japanese term yashiro. So yashiro, I, I, speak the, I say this to the Japanese audience, but uh, yashiro is originally Chinese character. So, but uh, yashiro it means a sacred soil or some kind of the small, you know, the Shintoist shrine architecture. It's a beautiful term. But also this yashiro is part of the word, uh, like kaisha is a business firm, and also shaka is society. So <laughs> it's very interesting. So he chose this character, yashiro, uh, to represent uh, commons, you know. Oh, <laughs> and um, this has triple implication. This term, Yashiro, has triple Im implication, uh, you know, for me. The first is uh, society. Society is open. And also community. It's a community is, you know, cohesion. And also the, you know, society, community, and association. Association is based on the kind of spontaneity, you know, voluntarism. So this is very complex, but uh, quite, you know, exciting our imagination. So the, the point is, um, for him, um, community cohesion is important, but this also should be open to the public, you know and um, should be based on the civil liberty, you know, not just parochial kind of, uh, you know, community, uh, you know, making, uh, mm -hmm. but also the, this must be based on the more, it should be the public goods. You know? So this duality is something, you know, uh, is, um, is, I was quite attracted by his writings, you know. <laughs> So, because many people uh, started to write about commons, 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 and community, but he was always keep himself open to the wider world. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm not very sure what kind of the relationship uh, you have developed with uh, Professor Uzawa, but uh, this is my observation based on my yeah. reading. <laughs> yeah. Well, Professor Uzawa and I uh, first got to know each other in 1965. Mm -hmm where he invited me out to the University of Chicago, where he was then uh, a professor, uh, a young, uh, very young professor, uh, made his mark in mathematical economics. Mm -hmm. And, but he, he always had this broader concern. He, he was writing mathematics, but he was uh, thinking about things in a very political, mm -hmm. in a very broad uh, uh, very broad terms. Um, and we stayed in touch. We did a book together. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I used to, whenever I came to Japan, we would uh, see each other. I saw him in Kyoto uh, uh, at Toshisha. Um, and we uh, talked about uh, environmental uh, issues uh, uh, while he was still there. Um, and um, what we never got into discussions of all the aspects that you've uh, just discussed, um, they're certainly consistent with uh, uh, my own uh, feelings that uh, one has to think about collective action, is the way I think, the word we use, collective action. Um, 
in terms of uh, m- taking many forms, uh, not just government, but also civil society, voluntary associations, I, you know, think of unions, cooperatives, uh, a whole variety of uh, institutions. But we also uh, need to think, of, when we think about government, government at multiple levels, and that for some problems, uh, we need to look at, at the local level mm-hmm. as the way to best implement. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, uh, one of the projects that we, we did when I was at the World Bank was a force management. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that, at least in some countries, uh, where you gave force management to the local community, they were much better mm-hmm. in preserving it because mm-hmm. they th- it was right around them. And uh, there's a lot of discussion right now uh, in terms of the climate change of how one can convert the Amazon, for instance, Mm -hmm. into a source of productive income for the local communities and have local communities control more control uh, rather than the deforestation Mm -hmm. that has marked the Amazon. Um, So the the issue of of trying to decentralize, bring things down, uh, and uh, engage in volunteerism to the extent possible, Mm -hmm. but there are limits to volunteerism. Uh, It has strength, it's limitations. Mm -hmm. Um, In my new book uh, 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 that I uh, come out in Japanese uh, a couple years ago, Mm -hmm. uh, People, Power, and Profits, Mm -hmm. one of the things I talk about in terms of the idea of progressive capitalism Mm -hmm is that it would involve a rich ecology of institutions, private and public, uh, NGOs, uh, uh, voluntary, uh, non-voluntary, at all levels, and that a successful society actually needs to have that rich ecology of institutional Mm -hmm. arrangements. Okay. So finally, uh, let me emphasize the uh, significance of building trust, you know, which was also the key word in your book on the uh, indicators. And actually, the JICA's uh, motto is just building trust and connecting the world. So uh, trust is quite important, and the trust is nurtured on the ground and also in the decentralized settings and making institutions accountable so so we can you know build trust you know gradually so um i think this is um, i think this uh, keyword will remain in the uh, jaicas vocabulary in the coming decades so trust is quite important especially because the world is now divided and the society is also divided and you are going to have the uh, can be, you know, it's quite important elections <laughs> this year. So the I think we can just, you know, um, build uh, the, you know, the crossing the borders. Some Japanese uh, economists and American economists, and not only economists but also the practitioners and all, you know, scholars of different disciplines. I think we should, uh, you know, try very hard to make the world, you know. The wall of uh, living <laughs> for all of us. I I agree. With trust is very important, and 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 in the sequel to the Sarkozy report, mm-hmm. San Fatusi Stiglitz report uh, that we did at OECD, we emphasized trust even more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, what has worried me is has been the uh, weakening of trust that we've seen including the trust in science. Mm-hmm. So the trust in our basic institutions, that societies can't function mm-hmm. if there is a breakdown uh, in trust. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, trust is, is really core. And then the next question is, how do we build trust? Mm-hmm. And I think uh, 
there are two things uh, that we've already talked about that are central to that. Mm -hmm. One is societies that are too divided, too much inequality, uh, are it's going to be difficult mm -hmm. to have trust. Mm -hmm. uh, when there's too much insecurity, uh, it's going to be hard to have uh, trust. Mm -hmm. uh, the system has failed mm -hmm. uh, in one way mm -hmm. or another. And the second is uh, a term I use very briefly, a voice. Mm -hmm. uh, you can only have trust when you believe you are being heard, when you are treated with dignity. That was a word that you used. Uh, that 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 is an essential part of uh, building trust. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, if you are felt you aren't being heard, uh, uh, and there isn't it, your your concerns are not respected, there will be a, a diminution mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in trust. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the issue of how we can help develop better sense of trust within our societies and between our societies is one of the key areas of, of research going forward. Within and between society, yes. So okay. The sociology has developed uh, quite a lot of uh, useful tools to measure so social capital. I think this is okay. also quite encouraging.